In the previous video, we have solved the problem of um, averaging projections of two transition dipole moments on two polarizations. So this was an issue that comes up in uh, linear spectroscopies, uh, basically comes in the first order Liouville pathways, if we can call it like that. And now we have a task which we actually denoted by the letter B, so this is at B from the last video, in which uh, we should be averaging a product of four projections between transition dipole moments and polarizations of the fields. This is the issue that comes up in uh, averaging the response corresponding to third order Liouville pathways. And so we ask ourselves what is the average of this expression here. Now, to evaluate this average, which is an average over all possible rotations of the whole molecule, which has transition dipole moments, any of the transition dipole moments of the molecules can be the D1, D2, D3, and D4. So D1, D2, D3, and D4 have specific relations, fixed relations with each other, but the whole complex can be rotated. So in order to define the molecule, we need to specify its transition dipole moments in some sort of a molecular frame, because the relations of these transition dipole moments, those that are relevant are between themselves, not those that are to the laboratory frame. However, um, the polarizations are defined in the laboratory frame, so we have to choose, uh, let's say, a single frame in which we would express uh, all the quantities. However, as I said, the transition dipole moments need to be expressed in the molecular frame, so we need to include a transformation between the molecular and laboratory frame, exactly as we did in the case A, where we averaged just uh, the two projections. So if we want to write the expression here, we first take the length of the transition dipole moments out, and so we will work with uh, the quantities, for instance, I mean, any dn would be written as the length of it, and then n, n, where n is a vector with the same direction as the transition dipole moments, but uh, of the length one. Okay, so now, including the transition between the molecular and laboratory frame and writing out this expression in the components, in let's say Cartesian coordinates, we, we would get the following. So first of all, we would have to sum over four different scalar products. So here we would have E1, I, E2, J, E3, K, and E4, E4, L. So we move the indices that distinguish the different polarizations up, and the lower indices are the components of the vector in Cartesian frame and actually in the laboratory frame here, then we would have a transformation between uh, the uh, between the laboratory frame and the molecular frame. So first of all, we can write here what we would have there would be the n1 n1i. So this together with this index here, so this index and this index, they all together, and this here sum, they build the scalar product. So if we continue here with the rest of the scalar products, we would have the expression for the directions of the transition dipole moments in the laboratory frame, but in fact we want to write it in the molecular frame. So for that we would need this uh, transformation tensor, into coordinates that we now denote alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which are in the molecular frame. And of course, that means that we are also summing over alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Now, the average that we do above now only concerns this big tensor here because the expression of its right-hand side, the ends, they are in the molecular frames and therefore they are fixed and the 
The polarizations are fixed in the laboratory frame, so these things are not actually touched by the averaging. The only averaging that we do here is uh, over the tensor. So one can try to think generally about how this tensor should look like, but uh, let's try to look at the problem somewhat differently. Anyway, I mean, the averaging that we'll do could, in principle, be done directly on this, on this tensor. We could kind of postulate some of the properties that the averaging will do. But in our case, let's actually have a look at how we could work directly with the average of this tensor here. Okay, so what we can write is the same thing again here with the sum over i, j, k, l and e1, e2, e3, e4, i, j, k, l, and here the average over n, 1, n2, n3, n4, i, j, k, l, and average. So this thing here, the last one, this, this thing, is a tensor which is already averaged over all possible rotations in space. The thing is that once you average something over all possible rotations in space, it cannot change anymore under any rotation that is a change of the basis. So if you rotate this tensor, this average tensor, it has to remain the same. And that means essentially that it has to be a multiple of some sort of a unity tensor because otherwise it would transform under the coordinate transformation. Uh, the thing is that here we have four different indices and the unity operator, or from this respect of being actually uh, invariant to the rotation, we have, uh, we have three different ways how to write a unity operator or unity tensor here. We have the tensor that looks like this. We have a tensor that would look like this, and we have a tensor that would look like this. And all three would remain invariant under the transformation of coordinates. So we will assume that this average tensor in yellow here is basically just a, pro uh, a, a sum of these three tensors arbitrary sum of these, well, not arbitrary, but that it's, it's a sum of these three tensors with some unknown coefficients. And we will try to figure out what these coefficients actually are in this particular, in this particular case. So taking the assumption here in green and inserting it into the expression for the average, we get the following. I mean, we have all these Kronecker deltas, so we can evaluate some of the sums. And we see that obviously there is a prefactor that we have to repeat always. And the next thing would be what? So if we take the delta i, j, delta k, l, and perform the sums, what we get is, first we will get a scalar product of uh, the first two polarization vectors. So we have E1 vector in a scalar product with E2 vector because uh, I has to be same as, uh, as the J. And because K has to be the same as L, we also get scalar product of the third and fourth polarization vector. And then we get A1. A yeah. The second step that we'll do is to evaluate the second possible version of the unity tensor, that is delta IK, delta JL. And again, there we get the scalar product of the first polarization vector with the third polarization vector and of the second polarization with the fourth polarization vector, exactly by the same token as before. And this is multiplied by, the, uh, by, by A2. And of course, the last would be easy, E1, E4, E2, E3, and A3. So this is what we can say now by basically assuming that the averaged tensor with four indices I, J, K, L has to be invariant 
under change of the coordinates, which amounts to rotation. Okay, so now we have unknown coefficients a1, a2, a3, and we may try to evaluate these, or we will try to evaluate these by identifying some invariants in the expression here, the, this yellow expression that we have here uh, in the uh, averaged tensor composed of the directions of the transition epoch moments. So now let's have a look uh, what kind of invariant expressions here we can build and use to evaluate the uh, coefficients a1, a2, and a3. So out of the uh, tensor that we have up here, average tensor, we can build the following invariants. For instance, we can sum this expression here over i and j that are the same and over k and l that are the same and look what what comes out so sum over i j n1 i n2 i and then n3 j n4 j averaged what is this this is an averaged scalar product of 1 and 2 and a scalar product of 3 and 4 averaged in space but now the problem is that in 1 and n2 they are always fixed with respect to each other no matter how you rotate uh, the whole complex that means that averaging does really nothing here these these two scalar products remain the same so this is the same expression but without any need for averaging. So that's one result that we have. And because we also have up here the assumption that the whole tensor depends in specific way on some unity tensors, we can also evaluate the same sum uh, over an expression which contains a1, a2 and a3. So taking the sum over ij and 1 i n 2i and 3j and 4j here will give me sum over ij a1 delta ii delta jj plus a2 delta ij delta ij plus a3 delta ij delta ij that's very simple just by using using the uh, the definition or the assumption uh, above and this thing results in well all these sums we can easily perform so in the first expression there is a1 and sum over j gives 3 and sum over i also gives 3 so quite easily for any value of i or j regardless of whether they are same or not we always get one and there are nine such situations or nine such uh, values so this is nine times a1 the second sum is actually contributing only when j equals i uh, we, and there are three situations uh, like this so this would be multiplied here by 3 and the last case we again have a multiplication by by 3. This is however not the only invariant that we can build. With the same summation over ij we can also combine the vectors n1 and n3. So we would have n1 with i, then we have n2 and n3 with i and n4 and we can put the j next to n2 and n4 and that gives me n1 scalar product with n3 and n2 scalar product with n4 and there's no need to average this again but the same way i can average this expression using the assumption above so i'm not gonna write it 
or I still will probably write it explicitly like this. So there is a one, and if you use the expression I, uh, delta i k delta j l and use the situation that we have here, these are these are i's here. Uh, we get delta i j delta i j plus a plus a two delta i i delta j j plus a3 delta i j delta i j that gives me a1 multiplied by 3 the same situation as above a2 multiplied by 9 and a3 multiplied by 3 interestingly the last possible uh, invariant here would get very similar shape again so here we have i at uh, n4 and n1 and j at 2 and 3 so this gives n1 n4 and n2 and 3 scalar products and at the same time this is going to be a1 multiplied by 3 plus a 2 multiplied by 3 plus a 3 multiplied by 9. So this is actually quite interesting because it gives us enough equations to evaluate uh, the a1, a2 and a3 coefficients in terms of the quantities that we can calculate, namely the scalar products of the orientation of the transition dipole moments that we somehow have to supply when we want to define the molecule. Okay. Uh, all these three equations taken together can be expressed in a matrix form. You can see that here these expressions, they look like multiplications of a matrix that has the following form 9, 3, 3, 3, 9, 3, 3, 3, 9. And they are multiplied by a vector of coefficients a1, a2, a three and this whole thing results in here the vector basically a set of results for the scalar products of uh, of ends so this would be the first one is n1 n2 n3 n4 so n1 n2 n3 n4 and because we we went systematically it would be easy to write the second situation and the last one we have above so that's n n1 n4 n2 n3 so this is um, a matrix equation for the so the only thing unknown here is a1 a2 and a3 so we would have to take an inverse of the matrix uh, here with the nines and and uh, threes in order to solve the problem and write an expression for a1, a2, a3. It's going to be the 9, 3, 3, 3, 9, 3, and 3, 3, 9, but inverse um, applied to a vector built out of these scalar products. I mean, it is important to realize that this is a completely general expression for a situation where the molecule is rigid and it can have whatever number of transition dipole moments because the N1, N2, N3 and N4, they don't count somehow the transition dipole moments in the molecules, but they count the transition dipole moments that appear in a Liouville pathway. So they so the single transition dipole moment can of course appear here many times. Now it is important to note that this matrix here can be actually relatively easily or nicely inverted. The result can be written in a nice form and is the following. It's again a symmetric matrix but with some pluses and minuses. And if we put everything together here, the result we are looking for, that is the average over four occurrences of transition dipole moments and four 
occurrences of the experimental laser pulse polarizations all averaged in space can be written as this scalar prefactor that's only the length of the transition dipole moments and then i mean let's have a look here this expression that i'll now put into a blue box this looks again as some sort of a product of two vectors this is actually a scalar product of two vectors one vector which is a1 a2 a3 components we have actually found an expression for that and the other vector is a vector built out of these scalar products very similar to the vector that we built out of the ends so what we can write here is that this is a scalar product scalar product can be written with the this vector of the e1 e2 e3 e4 and e1 e3 e2 e4 and e1 e4 e2 e3 that's a, that's a that's a vector but we need to transpose it because behind that we write the vector of a1 a2 and a3 with the transposition like this the typical rule for matrix multiplication will actually make a scalar product out of this and here we have the result from before which is the 1 over 30 4 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 4 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and 4 and here is the vector of the transition dipole moments n1 n2 n3 n4 n1 n3 n2 n4 and n1 n4 n2 n3 okay so we have a general expression for the average which is so general that it contains basically only the properties or only only the prop the properties of the molecule that are specified by the prefactor d1 d2 d3 that's that's easy that's the length of the transition dipole moments and then the geometry the whole geometry of the molecule is hidden in a vector of the scalar products of n's here and then there is a geometry of the experiment in a sense of the polarization uh, vectors hidden in the blue vector here which is transposed that is the, it's the lying vector and in the middle there is a matrix which actually kind of mediates the interaction if one may say so between uh, the vectors characterizing the the molecule and the vector characterizing the polarizations of the experiment okay so this is a general expression that can be used for any situation in a third order nonlinear response for every Liouville pathway that you need to evaluate you can do basically this same business this is something very simple to put into a program so averaging over all these um, spatially dependent components of the Liouville pathways is actually relatively easy as long as the molecule remains fixed in the experiment and as long as the spatial relations within the molecules do not break during the experiment okay it's uh, now maybe quite good to show some examples of the application of this expression so let's go for examples we have for instance a two-level system in which we have only one uh, transition dipole moment and uh, that's one special case that we can consider and there is a, a special case in which we have an experiment with the polarizations of the pulses all going the same direction so if we assume that there is an e e equals e1 equals e2 equals e3 equals e4 if we first leave all the transition dipole moments to be general then we have d1 e d2 e d3 e and d4 e the simplest experiment 
This will therefore be d1, d2, d3, d4 divided by 30. Here uh, we would have all the scalar products of the polarizations of the fields. And because we always have uh, three components that are equal one, so when we multiply this vector with the matrix of fours and minus ones, at each column of the uh, matrix, actually, we always get a sum of the values in uh, the column of the matrix. I mean, uh, a little bit of uh, thinking for yourself will help now here. So uh, that sum is four minus one minus one, so it's two. And we get this in each uh, single column of the matrix. So we have what we get by the by that product of the transposed vector of scalar products of the polarizations and the matrix in the middle of the expression is a vector that has three twos basically and it's a transposed vector and this is multiplied by the vector of n1 n2 n3 n4 and I'm not going to write all the uh, all the three expressions, but they are well known and very clear. So as a result, we get scalar products of these vectors, which will actually mean again that there will be a sum of all these scalar products of the orientations of the um, dipole moments in the molecule. So we get d1, d2, d3, d4 divided by 15. You basically take out the 2 here, and then we have the sum n1, n2 scalar product, n3, n4, plus n1, n3, n2, n4, plus n1, n4, n2, n3 and closing so this is it this is this is the result which is completely general for a situation in which we have multiple transition dipole moments or we can have different transition dipole moments and all the polarizations are the same again if we assume that there is some d which is equal to d1 equal to d2 equal to d3 equal to d4 this can occur of course this situation can occur in Liouville pathway which uh, addresses a single transition also within a molecule with many transitions. However, the most general situation in which uh, actually all pathways have this prefactor is the case where we have just one transition. And in that case, all the expressions actually collapse to d e to the fourth and then averaged. And uh, this must by looking at the expression here, must collapse into three contributions that are exactly the same. So the sum here gives three, and three divided by 15 it weighs one over five, and the transition dipole moment prefactor is also d to the four. So this is the result that we get for a two-level system or for any pathway that contains only one transition. Also, this expression is relatively general because it applies to any pathway in an experiment uh, with the uh, degenerate polarizations. Okay, so this is a situation here that, that we have all the transition dipole moments the same. For instance, this is a situation when we get a signal from a single uh, state in the excited state. The stimulated emission, for instance, from a single state in the excited state would have uh, this prefactor, but there are also situations in which we automatically uh, have to get transition dipole moments uh, different in this uh, uh, in this arrangement. At least some of them have to be different. One such a situation is energy transfer. So let's look at the energy transfer prefactors, or let's say the prefactors that apply to the pathways that describe energy energy transfer. So energy transfer. So let's start with some sort of a diagram. We have a molecule with a ground state and in order to allow energy transfer between states, we would have 
mm, two states one and two and let's assume that first you know if we are looking at stimulated emission for instance we would first have to excite by two pulses the uh, the molecule or, or the, the state two then we would have a process of energy relaxation or energy transfer from state two to one this might for instance also be a spatial transfer from one molecule to another molecule if this is a larger complex and if we follow the Lewell pathway diagram which we'll do quickly uh, this would mean that, that there will be one uh, process of de-exciting the state uh, one which is stimulated and then the rest of uh, the uh, signal is produced uh, by uh, the coherence that is left uh, that is left in this uh, system so this it's of course uh, easy to say but one can hardly imagine anything behind that so let's draw the Feynman diagram which might make it a little bit more clear so let's draw for instance rephasing a uh, rephasing situation with the stimulated emission so we start with the in the ground state we excite to state two second pulse also will excite to state two then we have the process of relaxation we end up in one and in order to complete this to a standard level pathway we'll have to leave here to we'll put let's say the right hand side of the diagram to the ground state and here this last coherence produces uh, the correct signal and every level pathway has to end up in a population of some state so it has to end up with gg ee etc so in this case we end up with ee so this is the process described by this by this diagram here in the middle we have energy transfer now what does that mean for the uh, evaluation of the prefactor that uh, of the level pathway that is the averaging uh, the, the average of the transition dipole moments uh, sticking to the situation with single polarization we would have the following situation the first two interactions happen with some sort of a transition dipole moment well we don't have to actually uh, yeah we, we should better denote it d2 so that's the uh, transition dipole moment from the ground state to state 2 and the second two interactions as you can see from the Liouville diagram they occur with uh, D1 and taking the expression uh, that we found earlier this has to be uh, the, then prefected with D1 D2 which are the lengths of the transition dipole moments which can be different divided by 15 and here we have a sum of the scalar products of the orientations of the transition dipole moments. One of them, the one uh, where we take a scalar product of the D, of the, the, you know, of the first two occurrences of the transition dipole moments, that has to be one. Then we will have scalar product of this one with this one that contribution will have to lead to n2 and 1 and actually the second one is here d2 d1 that is therefore the uh, n2 and 1 again and the last uh, combination would be this d2 and this one here so obviously we get a factor of two here so that's uh, that's it that's the average that we get for the energy transfer process and of course if we would be looking for the stimulated emission from the state two we would have all the transition dipole moments the same and we would have a factor three and for instance in a case that the transition dipole moments of this uh, to the state two and to the state one would be orthogonal then we would have a three times less signal coming from the process of the energy transfer than from the standard stimulated emission from a state that didn't decay so we can see that sometimes it is questionable in pump probe experiment to judge processes from 
directly from the amplitudes. We actually have to know what kind of process we are looking at. For instance, we would be losing, by the decay, we would be losing signal from the state two, the stimulated emission, and there would be a rising signal from one. But obviously, if the transition dipole moments were orthogonal, the rise would be three times smaller than the loss. So comparing this, of course, in this case, doesn't mean that the signal went also to some other state where we don't see it, for instance. It actually means that due to the different orientations of the transition dipole moments and the averaging, we have lost the overall signal without actually losing the excitation. The excitation still stays between the state 2 and 1 and the probability of finding our molecule in state 2 and in state 1 is still conserved despite um, a loss of the overall signal. Very similar situation can occur in observing so-called coherences. So we can in principle also observe signal that basically shows or demonstrates the fact that we have excited a superposition of the state one and two. So let's have a look at that situation. So coherence is what we want to look at here. The same situation with states can be drawn, state G and one and two. And now the process is that first two pulses, they excite, uh, they excite states, for instance, the first one excites two and the second one excites, uh, excites one. Then uh, the uh, signal in the capital T will actually oscillate. There will be some some oscillatory signal uh, coming here and then we can for instance well let's see let's draw uh, the, the diagram first and then we decide how to complete this process so we will again look at a rephasing signal which starts let's start with two for instance ground state ground state and ground state the second excitation will be one so here we have one two and this is the oscillatory signal, which will uh, look like this. It will oscillate with, with this frequency and this phase. Here we will lose the signal at 2. So we'll go to 1 and the signal will actually emit at a different position than it was excited. So complete the diagram. The third interaction is with the two, so it's like this, and the signal will appear from one. This is also a real signal that we can observe in pump probe, although very often weak. And we can also see that here, when we evaluate a, a very similar expression from above, it will be D1, or no, D2 is the first, then we have D1, D2 again, and D1. And because this is basically up to an order, the same expression as above, we can again conclude that this is going to be D1, D2 squared divided by 15. And here I have 1 plus 2, and 1, and to square. So this is also a signal which is going to be slightly uh, diminished depending on the mutual orientation of the transition dipole moments from the ground state to the states one and two. So clearly there is a lot of space for playing with the polarizations possibly to, because that's, that's another degree of freedom that we can get into this business of modulating the signals and uh, uh, you know, trying to kind of uh, find out something about the orientational relations of the transitions uh, in, the, uh, in the molecule, because obviously the strength of different signals depends on the geometry of the molecule, even though everything is averaged over all possible orientations of the molecule. So this is how uh, we can average basically any um, contribution to the pump probe spectroscopy and similar uh, third order nonlinear spectroscopies. 
and that basically what i mean what we've shown is very general so we can basically end up here and if you want to simulate anybody's experiment you have everything in your hands now in order to do it you can simulate spectra or those line shapes that we have considered they are not overly realistic however everything to understand a particular experiment is uh, at your disposal at the moment you have everything now if you would do this and you ask your experimental colleague give me the data and tell me what polarizations you used in your experiment you would often figure out that experimentalists do their pump probe experiment using the so-called magic angle between the pump and probe pulses and magic angle and the reason why this particular angle is used and why people do not use a single polarization for all pulses in their pump probe experiments will be explained in the following. So let's look at the magic angle and let's think about the following in your pump probe experiment. So if you have a sample, you send your pump and probe pulses from different directions. So this will be your pump, this will be your probe, you detect the intensity of your probe pulse which is different because of the absorption in the sample, the, the probe pulse will change its intensity as it passes through the, uh, through the sample. And from that you want, to, you want to learn something about the processes in the molecules in the sample. But you will figure out that the polarization of the pump pulse and the probe pulse, okay, so let's do it like this, is usually set to some so-called magic angle of 54.7 degrees in the experiment that, uh, that the experimentalists give to you. So you, of course, have everything in your hand to simulate that. You just mm, evaluate the averages with this uh, specific angle between the pump and probe uh, polarizations, but you may be asking why, why these experimentalists actually do it. And they do it for the following reason. So imagine that you have a pump probe experiment in which you are looking at some relatively slow process uh, in your molecules and the delay between the pump and probe pulses is large. So your probe pulse, so if I have a T running like this, I, send, I set zero time into the middle of the probe pulse, but my pump pulse comes before at time minus capital T and capital T is relatively large. So even if you have a two level molecule in solution, the molecule might have normally a transition dipole moment D at some orientation at time minus T, but because it is surrounded by other molecules, and it can rotate, it is hit by the molecules so that it not only diffuses in space but also diffuses rotationally. It may happen that at time t equals zero, the same molecule will have a transition dipole moment oriented in a different direction. So everything that we have said so far uh, about the pump probe spectroscopy would have to be changed because even, you know, we, we have done our averaging assuming that the transition dipole moment does not change or when it rotates, it only rotates because there are many molecules. So there was another molecule in that sample which was oriented in a different way at time minus t. But that molecule is now oriented in a random relation both towards the other molecule and towards the original uh, original D. So, you know, here the time T passes and the molecule basically rotationally diffuses. This is a big problem because it invalidates our analysis of the averaging, but maybe there are some ways around it. So, the reason why experimentalists set their pump probe experiment in the magic angle is actually to avoid the process of rotational diffusion to influence the pump probe spectra and in the following we'll basically try to see how that how that comes about so let us assume that we have a pump pulse with the polarization 
E P U and in our notation the first two pulses therefore will have the same polarization equal E P U. The probe the probe is the pulse that at one situation or let's say one of its functions in the pump probe experiment is to hit the molecule and make an excitation to it. That's the pulse E3, the third, third polarization of the pulses uh, is the one of the probe. And then we mix the signal back with the third order signal in this so-called so heterodyne detection. So the fourth occurrence uh, of the polarization of the field, that's also the probe orientation. And now we are therefore averaging the following projections, D capital T, which is the transition that we hit at the time minus capital T of our experiment, E pump, D E pump, that's the first, and the second two transitions will be D zeros. So D zero E probe, and D zero probe again. Now, looking at this, because the length of D T and D zero is going to be the same, or we assume that it's going to be same, we can write, well, we don't have to have that, but obviously if it's only diffusion uh, rotation, they will be the same, but we can write it like this. These both uh, numbers are the same divided by 30. And here we should have the mutual orientations of the pump and probe polarizations accounted for. So in the first scalar product, we always have the pump with pump and probe with probe in a scalar product. However, the second two occurrences of the mutual projections of the polarizations, they will always be between pump and probe. So we can write E PU scalar product with E probe and square. And the last one is the same. Okay, so that's this, this vector is transposed. Then we would have here the matrix of fours and minus ones. And in the last column, or in, the, in this last vector, we have now the mutual relations of the transition dipole moments. We have dt and d0. So in the first case, we would also have the projection of dt on dt and d0 on d0. So this means one. But again, the second element of this vector already contains basically scalar products between dt and d0. So there will be n t n0 square and n t n0 square again. Now because of the rotational, rotational diffusion, this term here that the nt n0 is not going to be fixed. This is the thing that is subject to the to the diffusion. So let's see in what way it appears in our signal. So following the evaluation of these matrices here, we, we first get an dt square d0 square divided by 30. Here uh, we define one and because this scalar product is a scalar product of two unity vectors, we basically can write cosine phi, cosine square phi here, where the where phi is the angle between the pump polarization and the probe polarization. So this is the angle, this is the angle phi and we get a cosine square of it in this vector here. Okay, then the next step would be to actually perform the matrix vector multiplication here, which will lead to four minus n t n zero square minus n t n zero square. Then we have minus one plus four times n t and zero square minus nt 
and zero square and minus one minus nt and zero square plus four times nt and zero square and this is also a vector now okay so putting everything together again dt square d zero square 30 and here we get four minus and now let's make this uh, make this uh, simpler so we define the following quantity delta t zero which is the n t n zero so in here we are going to have two delta t zero square plus cosine square phi and here we find three times delta t zero square minus one plus cosine square phi and three times delta t zero square minus one. This is basically just uh, using uh, the multiplication here. We should not forget that this is transposed. So then it's uh, clear how to use the, the multiplication of these two vectors. It's a simple, simple scalar product. And simplifying this, we get the following result. First of all, there is always a factor of two present here. So we can take that out and, uh, and use the, the half of 30 here. So we have two minus delta T O square plus cosine square phi multiplying the three times delta t o square minus one and that we can write in a form that this delta which is the only thing that is subject to the rotation here or to the rotational dephasing is isolated um, with with some pre prefactor i mean just to uh, just to show what i mean is i will write the following result there is a there is three times cosine square phi minus one, which is a prefactor of delta t zero square. And the rest of the formula is two minus cosine square phi. Now you can see that there is a prefactor in front of the only part of this response, which is subject to the rotational diffusion. And that prefactor, that prefactor can be maybe set to zero. So can I set this to zero? Can I actually set the polarization between the pump and probe in such a way that the contribution, the f complete contribution uh, of the rotational diffusing will, will disappear? Yes, I actually can. So if I say that I want to choose uh, phi in such a way that three cosine square phi is equal to one that is certainly possible because cosine square phi is smaller than one and out of that basically arc cosine of one over square root of three this is roughly 54.7 degrees and this is the so-called magic angle the angle which uh, when used uh, between the pump and probe pulses in this situation we can eliminate the change of the orientation of the transition dipole moments between the situation of excitation that is the pump pulse and the situation of the emission which only comes after this potentially long delay uh, long delay t. I mean having a three pulse experiment or even a two pulse experiment or a pulse with finite pulses there is always a possibility that the molecule will rotate for instance within the length of the pulse. However length of the pulse is something very small and most often we can completely neglect the effect. However capital T can be a long time it can be picoseconds it can be even nanoseconds maybe and in that situation it is extremely important that we actually avoid uh, measuring a signal 
that can deal decay with time. You know, the more the molecule possibly diffuses rotationally, uh, the less signal we are going to get depending on T, yet this does not signify any excited state process within the molecule. It only signifies the fact that the molecule actually uh, rotates. So we have seen here the situation which would apply not only to a one transition dipole moment, that transition dipole moment doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be the same. We can also have the D0 here, a different transition dipole moment. The diffusion, what it does is that it breaks the relations between the transition dipole moments in the molecule. So if we have a molecule with two transition dipole moments oriented, for instance, this way, so this will be D1 and D2, we will have a measurement in which we first excite, let's say, the state 2, then there will be relaxation and we will be measuring D1. That's a situation we have already discussed. Ground state is 1, 2. So if we have this situation, we actually first excited this transition dipole moment. And if the molecule wouldn't rotate, we would easily get a signal from the E2 and we have already managed to average that signal over the rotation of the whole molecule. I mean, rotation of the molecule, I mean uh, that that's an averaging over a sample of molecule. Individual molecules are actually uh, always fixed. But if the molecule in the time uh, T rotates in some way, so then we have D1 and D2 oriented in a new direction and there is a rotational diffusion of the D2. So in this situation we have the DT equal to D1 here and D0 equal to D2 but the one that is diffused. And that's a situation which is basically exactly the same as what we have described above. Obviously, uh, there will be a dependence on the angle between D1 and D2, but we can actually show by exactly the same procedure that even this contribution uh, of the diffusion of a different transition dipole moment is eliminated by the uh, magic angle. Well, we can continue, or I mean, in order to make that proof a little bit more general, let's have a look at the situation of the coherence. So coherence, and again we ask the question whether the magic angle eliminates the contribution of the diffusion. So we have to average D1, E pump, D2, E pump. In the case of coherence, we are actually exciting two different transition dipole moments, so D1 and then D2. That was the pump pulse. I mean, the pump pulse can cover, of course, the both transitions if it's broad enough. And then we have D3, E probe, D4, E probe. So we assume that this coherence can actually travel to other states, which is something that we have initially discussed as uh, forbidden, but even if it wouldn't, we can prove that uh, rotational averaging, the way that we do it with the magic angle, actually eliminates the process of, uh, of diffusion. So writing this result would look like this. Again, we have pump and probe, and we already know how the contribution to the scalar products of the mm, polarizations would look like. Here we, this is transposed, we have the matrix of force, force and, and uh, uh, minus ones. And here we have a completely general vector of the transition dipole moments projections.
well in this case it's one two three four and one and two and no and three and two and four and n one and four and n two and three okay so looking at this there's a there's a very important thing that we can see in this uh, last vector so the d1 and d2 transition dipole moments they are addressed by the first pulse so they are addressed basically simultaneously then uh, there is a there is a potentially a long waiting time and the then the d3 and d4 are addressed at about the same time so d3 and d4 do not diffuse with respect to each other and d1 and d2 cannot diffuse with respect to each other so basically the first product is fixed always there is no influence of diffusion on this first element of the last vector here so this element is not influenced by rotational diffusion whereas you can see that n1 with respect to n3 will diffuse n2 with respect to n4 will diffuse and the same n1 with respect to n4 and so on all the other elements here will be subject to diffusion subject to diffusion which means they have to be eliminated otherwise our signal is going to depend on on the diffusion so we can we can define quantities delta 1 which will be the n1 n3 n2 n4 and delta 2 will be n1 n4 n2 n3 these two these quantities depend on the diffusion and we define also delta which is the first of these guys that does not depend at all on the diffusion and the average that we want to evaluate now equals actually it equals delta d1 d2 d3 d4 divided by divided by 30 here we have 1 cosine phi square cosine phi square 4 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 4 minus 1 and minus 1 minus 1 4 and here we have 1 because we divide it by by delta and in here we have delta 1 divided by delta and delta 2 divided by delta and they these contributions both depend uh, depend on the diffusion so continuing this we get delta d1 d2 d3 d4 divided by 30 we multiply uh, the matrix with the vector from the right hand side so we get we get this we get 4 minus delta 1 plus delta 2 divided by delta here we get minus 1 plus 4 times delta 1 divided by delta minus delta 2 divided by delta and here it is minus 1 minus delta 1 divided by delta plus 4 times delta 2 divided by delta that's a vector this vector here is transposed so the result is delta d1 d2 d3 d4 divided by 30 and very similar as before we get 4 minus delta 1 plus delta 2 divided by delta plus 4 times delta 1 minus delta 2 divided by delta minus 1 cosine square phi and basically the same thing except of the delta 2 and delta 1 
um, exchanged minus one cosine theta phi we close this and putting all the factors together we actually get delta d1 d2 d3 d4 divided by 30 and we can write 4 times minus 2 cosine square phi plus delta 1 plus delta 2 divided by delta and 3 cosine square phi minus 1 so again the same situation the same magic angle eliminates all the occurrences of the delta 1 and delta, delta 2 which are the only elements of the response or of the average that depend on the rotational diffusion within this uh, period of time that is the same as or that's basically the period of time or the delay between the uh, pump and probe pulse so magic angle works also in this more general case I mean I have initially uh, talked about the case of coherence talking about d1 and d2 but in here you can see that I can also detect a different coherence this is basically a completely general expression so this is not just the coherence this is actually any process that can occur in nonlinear spectroscopy of the third order and which depends on the rotational diffusion in this uh, delay T, all that can be eliminated by the same magic angle. So magic angle works generally. Uh, magic angle works basically for all the processes that depend on the diffusion in time capital, uh, capital T. And that is the reason why pump probe experiments are basically always, whether you expect or not, this type of process, they are always done with the magic angle of 5 equal to 54.7 degrees. In the context of the averaging of our signals over all the possible orientations of molecules in our sample, we've considered a, an isotropic sample in which all orientations have the same probability. In this context, we have to mention a special case of the even order uh, spectroscopies. So we have considered averaging of the first order spectroscopies, which have responses of even a number of contributions that looked like this. For instance, for the uh, spectroscopy of the first order and uh, in the third order spectroscopy we had four different transition dipole moments and generally uh, four different polarizations so this was the third order so there is always n plus one a number of elements in the averaging for an nth order spectroscopy and these two things we found in general not equal uh, zero but we can also verify that if you take a scalar product of just one transition dipole moment uh, and uh, assume a fixed polarization that this is going to average into zero very clearly there's a fixed projection and that projection can take any possible values and for each value there's always a contribution which has a projection which is uh, exactly the opposite so altogether averaging over the single occurrence of these things over the whole space always gives zero but interestingly also higher order contributions those that come from even order spectroscopies so for instance d1 from a hypothetical second order spectroscopy so d1 d2 d3 these things also average into zero that's quite important and despite the fact that purely theoretically on the phenomenological side of it 
we can assume that there would be some sort of a three-wave mixing process in which you uh, combine the k vectors in such a way that your signal will be, for instance, going in a direction k1 plus k2, which would mean that you would have the signal frequency as a sum of the first and second frequency. They can be gen they generate, so you can basically generate, for instance, the second harmonics. Even though this is easily possible and the signal would go, it would, would have a spatial, spatial relation that would look, look like this. And the phase that would potentially look like some frequency here. That all is possible within the discussion that we had uh, initially on uh, the phenomenology or classical Maxwellian description uh, of the response. All that is possible, but you have to imagine that each corresponding Liouville pathway, which would generate just such signal of the second order, would have to have odd number of members in the averaging above and would give zero in a situation that the distribution of the molecules in the sample is isotropic so all directions are equally equally probable so that means that by means of third or, or three pulse or three wave mixing you cannot produce a second harmonic in an isotropic uh, sample so we cannot produce second harmonic or a sum frequency in an isotropic sample. This is purely, the argument is really purely based on the averaging of the projections of the transition dipole moment of the molecules and let's say the number of elements that you have to put into the prefactor of the corresponding Liouville pathway for that signal. This, however, means, and it's quite interesting, that if you break uh, the condition of isotropy, you can produce second harmonic. So it's, for instance, possible to construct a microscopy, sort of second harmonic or some frequency microscopy, which is then sensitive only to areas in which the molecules uh, that you are looking at are not distributed isotropically and such areas are, for instance, membranes, which are two-dimensional and if you have something on them, this is not due to the membrane oriented isotropically in three-dimensional space and such a part of your sample can actually generate uh, second harmonics. So although we are ignoring even order spectroscopies, uh, these provide for some quite interesting topic for themselves. And in general, whatever we talk about in this spectroscopy can almost always be extended in all directions that you can think of. The last topic that I want to address today is basically the main role of pump probe spectroscopy in um, monitoring processes in molecules and that is its role in monitoring the energy transfer between states. You know, pump probe actually allows to measure various kinetic processes between states of uh, multi-state molecules and let's have a look how that is actually done. So if we have a three-level molecule which uh, often can be basically some sort of a aggregate where different states, for instance, A and B here, correspond to different uh, molecules in that sample. So for instance, we can have this situation that the molecule A looks like this and next to it, there is a molecule B with its excited state. Now the ground state that we look at uh, here on the left hand side diagram, that's a collective collective ground state of the two molecules. So that's a state in which these two, both of these two molecules are in the ground state. The white state A on the left hand side is a situation in which the molecule B is in the ground state and the molecule A is excited. And the state B on the left hand side is again a situation that the molecule A is not excited and molecule B is excited. That's the, that's, uh, that's the situation that we want to describe 
And now we would ideally assume that our pump probe experiment can, for instance, do the following. Excite first the state A, which means the pump occurs on the molecule A only. And then we want to watch the energy transfer from state A to B, which is the energy transfer from the molecule A to B, which occurs with some rate K B A. So here we have the, the pump, we have the pump here, we have the, the transfer and probe. Probe will occur exclusively on the B molecule because when we excited A and we can be looking at what happens at B. So in that case we would have stimulated emission and the signal coming uh, all from B. So what would the uh, what would the pump probe spectrum then look like in this situation? I mean one thing is that in order to get a perfect resolution about what is the molecule A and molecule B we would have to excite and the excite on different frequencies. So there would be a pump frequency and there would be a probe frequency. So our plot would also uh, look in such a way that we would have the omega B, the, the molecule B frequency and omega A uh, frequency distinguished in our experiment. And we actually would like to measure delta A at T equals zero and for instance delta A at some later later time for the same situation. So at t equals zero, if we concentrate only on the pump probe spectrum or the probe spectrum, basically probe absorption around uh, the molecule B, because initially B is not excited, it's not going to have any ground state bleach, it's not going to have any stimulated emission, so there will be basically no signal. So the detecting around uh, omega b there will be no signal at t equals zero but at later times when the excitation actually manages to get from molecule a to molecule b we will have stimulated emission and we also have to have ground state bleach because the transfer from kba uh, for due to kba rate from a to b means that the molecule a was the excited and the molecule B was excited. So there must also be a ground state bleach. Basically there will be a normal pump probe signal occurring at the later times uh, as the state B uh, will get populated. So we can see a perfectly normal negative because there is less absorption pump probe uh, signal occurring. So now I can make some plots of, uh, for instance, the amplitude of the pump probe spectrum at the frequency omega b. So I'll try to draw this and I will actually draw mal minus delta a at minus delta a at the frequency omega b with the pump at omega a. That's what I'm drawing here. And if I draw the minus, it's clear that at the beginning this is going to be zero, at t, at t equal zero this is going to be zero, and then I am going to have a, an exponential rise because the process occurs with the rate kba, so I will, I'm going to have a rise which will then saturate and ending up populating, maybe depending on the temperature, maybe completely the state, the state b. Okay, so that's that's what I can uh, what I can assume, and this rise here, this rise here, the tau b a constant here, the time at which this curve is going to rise, will be one over k b a. So I'm able to measure with this spectrum or with this analysis of the pump probe spectrum, I'm able to measure the k b a uh, rate of the transfer from a to b. If I would make a pump at the frequency omega a and also probe at omega a. So there's pump at omega a and probe at omega a. Uh, this obviously because that's the same as in the situation of a two-level system. 
which gets the excited at the beginning i'm going to get uh, some value initially after after the excitation i'm going to get some initial value of the pump probe spectra of the differential absorption and then this is going to decay exponentially to zero again with a times constant ba which is one over k ba i mean the amplitudes of those initial signals or let's say of the initial signal and the decay signal they don't have to be the same if the transition dipole moments were the same the, the amplitude of the of this two color pump probe that is pumping at one frequency and probing at another frequency would be smaller than the initial amplitude of the uh, pump probe on that two uh, level system so you know you can imagine that with this technique where you change the frequency of the exciting light you could make some sort of a contour plot in two dimensions where you would always draw let's say the pump frequency and probe frequency and put some values or draw in uh, some values uh, of your um, of your signal at different frequencies as the delay between the pulses progresses so at time t at some chosen time t you would be able to draw signal on different areas for instance at the frequency omega b and omega a we would have always some signal so if i for instance pump and probe and omega b that's here this would behave like a two level system so i'm going to get basically some value at all possible frequencies i'm going to get some sort of a contour plot that might look like this so both the pump around omega b will always get some signal uh, that will be produced then as a stimulated emission at uh, at omega b the same thing will happen at the omega a frequency so if i take the pump and probe frequency of omega a i am also going to get a signal at omega a although this signal will decay dk with factor e to the power of k b a capital t so that's the same capital t as uh, as as here this is the the time at which i'm basically making this uh, this plot or, or a delay at which i'm making making this plot but as this diagonal signal that was pumped and probed at omega a decays there is also a rising signal uh, which is pumped at omega a and probed at omega b so there is going to be another signal which rises there's a rising signal that occurs at a frequency that that combines the pump at omega a and probe at omega b so this is a very nice plot which which actually would be very informative if i could do it for every frequency here the problem is that when I start probing with narrow pulses in frequency, so probing and pumping with frequency resolution. So if I, if I uh, take a frequency resolution, for instance, delta omega, the length of the pulse will increase as I go down with delta uh, omega. So the length of the pulse, and that is time resolution scales with one over delta omega. So the narrower in frequency the pulses are, the longer the, pulse, the pulses will be in time and the worse will be the time resolution. I cannot observe uh, relaxations that are faster, for instance, than the width uh, of the pulse because you know, I have to assume in my theory and even in the experiment, of course, that my pulses are able to distinguish the time-dependent processes. 
and they clearly would not be if they were longer than the processes that we use them to observe. Uh, now, that means that there is a trade-off between time resolution and frequency resolution, and I cannot actually observe ultra-fast processes in this, uh, in this way. However, th there is a little workaround in this. This is not uh, that I, we would be completely breaking this um, rule, which basically forbids us to observe something with ideal frequency and time resolution at the same time. Uh, there is a workaround which we will try to construct in next video. Basically, we will try to construct an experimental technique which takes the good thing from the pump probe, that is the ability of observing uh, all these time-resolved processes, and somehow automatically gets us pictures like this, two-dimensional spectra, with frequency resolution that is better than what one would expect if they were measured in this pump probe manner.